Welcome to the Lord's House for worship today. It's good to look out and see you in person. It's also good to have those who are viewing today via the web stream, and we ask God's blessings to be upon you all as well. Just a few things as quick as possible by way of announcement. Please keep in mind tonight is our quarterly conference right here in the sanctuary at 6 p.m. In preparation for that meeting, we do have copies of the financial report, and you will be able to receive those immediately following the worship service. The ushers will have those for distribution. Tomorrow night is our Board of Deacons meeting for the month of January. This coming Wednesday, we have our full schedule of activities. Next Sunday will be our second offering for our denominational ministry of the month, and that ministry for January is Original Free Will Baptist Retirement Homes. And then coming up in less than two weeks now, we have the Deacon's Pancake and Sausage Supper. That is scheduled for Friday the 27th from 5 until 7. Tickets are $8. You can see any of our deacons. Who of the deacons still has some tickets available? See a show of hands. You don't have any, <laughs> you've got some, they're just not on you. All righty. Yours aren't on you either, Linwood. Okay. <laughs> well, the good news is, if you don't have a physical ticket, we will still feed you. You can bring your $8 on the 27th. If you dine in, it's an all-you-can-eat function. If you take out, unfortunately, you can't keep coming back, coming back, coming back. But I think it's a pretty good deal, and it's only $8. Can't beat that. Can't buy many tickets this day and time for just $8. Marcy, anything you want to? Okay. I didn't know if there was anything else to it. Saturday, February the 4th. That is the church night at the University of Mount Olive, the basketball games, the men's game, the women's game. Begins at 5... Okay, four o'clock. Okay, and if you're interested, let you know. Okay. Any other announcements? And it's only a dollar. Yeah, you can't go to a basketball game for a dollar. You can't even buy popcorn or a drink for a dollar. And Mount Olive games are pretty good. They're they're pretty good at basketball. 
Well, hearing none, let us now prepare our minds and our hearts as we worship God together. of call to worship. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the desolate pit out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed are those who make the Lord their trust, who do not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after false gods. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts toward us. None can compare with you. Were I to proclaim the, to tell them, they would be more than can be counted. At this time, Mr. Jerry Godwin, will you lead us in our invocation? Our song of celebration is hymn number two, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Teach me some melodious song. 
peace of Christ to you this morning. Peace of Christ to all of you this morning. Our Old Testament lesson today comes from Isaiah 49, verses 1 through 7. Hear the words of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 49, 1 through 7. Listen to me, O coastlands. Pay attention, you peoples from far away. The Lord called me before I was born. While I was in my mother's womb, he named me. He made my mouth like a sharp sword, and in the shadow of his hand he hid me. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver he hid me. And he said to me, You are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and vanity. Yet surely my cause is with the Lord, and my reward with my God. And now the Lord says, who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the sight of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. He says, It is too light a thing that you should be my servant, to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the survivors of Israel. I will give you as a light to the nations, and that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One, to one deeply despised, abhorred by the nations, the slave of rulers. Kings shall see and stand up, princes, and they shall prostrate themselves because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be unto God. God. As we turn our hearts and minds to the Lord in prayer this morning, I draw your attention to the back portion of the bulletin. You'll see many names reflected there within our church body and also within our extended community. Uh, we continue to remember Miss Sandra Joyner during her hospitalization in Greenville. We also remember Tim Wiggs as he's recovering from shoulder surgery that took place this past Monday. Are there other names, other needs that you would bring to our attention this morning? Lynn Watson. Jack and Melda Langley, the family of Johnny Griffin, anyone else, perhaps through uplifted hands. God sees each and every heart, and God understands the depths of our needs and our hurts. Would you bow with me for a time of prayer? Lord, because of your love, grace, and mercy, you have given all of, us, all of us a song to sing. We may think of ourselves as not being musically inclined or talented when it comes to singing, but the words of the psalmist remind us that through our relationship with you, you have given us reason to celebrate, reason to rejoice. And Lord, we live in a world where that's sometimes difficult to do because we see so much pain and so many struggles. But Lord, we're grateful that you work in and through the difficult times, reminding us that we're not alone, giving us the strength we need for the living of such times. And Lord, that's something we should celebrate. Lord, you've been good to us in countless ways. You've seen us through difficult moments. You've answered prayers. You've supplied need after need each and every day. Forgive us, Lord, when we fail to express our gratitude. But, Lord, we truly are indebted to you. Because, Lord, you are better to us than anything we even deserve. 
And that's the work of grace. It's your unmerited favor. And it's that theme that we celebrate this morning in worship. Help us to realize it's not by anything that we've done or said or been able to achieve that gets us this grace. It's through you and you alone that we experience such goodness. Today, Lord, we come with so many needs that are close to our hearts and our minds where people are in need of love and grace and mercy. People are feeling alone during difficult moments. Individuals are sick and hospitalized. Some are home recovering from surgeries. A number of families are grieving at the passing of loved ones. Some have received diagnoses in recent days that are far from favorable. This world can be unfair. Times can be overwhelming, but we are grateful that you are our constant. You are the rock and the fortress we can lean upon for strength each and every single day. Lord, hear the prayers of your children this morning as we intercede on behalf of so many people we know, people we may not know as well, but we know that each and every name, each and every family is very precious in your sight. Be with us, Lord, as we continue in this season of worship and prepare us, Lord, to go forth into the mission field around us to be your hands and feet with the hours and the days ahead. This prayer we lift up this morning in your Son's most precious and holy name. Jesus Christ.
in the affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed. Let us begin. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Church Universal, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated and the children may come with me to Junior Church. Our sermon text for today is taken from Paul's letter to the believers in Corinth. The letter that we know of as 1 Corinthians, and we'll be looking at chapter 1, verses 1 through 9 this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and verses 1 through 9. May we give ear to the reading of God's Word. Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes to the church of God that is in Corinth to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus called to be saints together with all of those who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ both their Lord and ours grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given you in Christ Jesus. 
For in every way you have been enriched in him, in speech and knowledge of every kind, just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you, so that you do not lack or are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you await for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. By him you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Brothers and sisters, may God add a blessing to this, the reading, hearing, understanding, and living of these words for our days. Amen. A couple of weeks ago, Marcy walked into my office as I was shifting some things around, specifically a certain series of toy tractors that I was gifted with at Christmas in 1989. I have all but two tractors in this particular series made by the Ertl Toy Company. And when Marcy walked in, she says, do you have them perfect enough? You see, I'd been shifting some books around, but in order to get the books like I wanted them, and I try to keep the books categorized by commentary, by spiritual faith formation, by practical church ministry, and so forth, to get to the books, a lot of times I have to remove things that are on the shelving in front of the books. And so I take these tractors off, and I said, well... I want them back. I want the books in the right place, but I want the tractors just right, and I'm hoping eventually to get the two that I'm missing from this particular series. And so I'm there, I'm lining them up, and I've got the couple of John Deere's together, the couple of Farmalls together, the Massey Harris's together, the Cases together. Everything has to be according to its particular make and model and so forth. But to hear Marcy to inquire about were well, they perfect enough, she definitely has my number she knows my game a lot of times she'll accuse me of being obsessive compulsive when it comes to a lot of things if things are on my desk I try to shift them a little bit for example my laptop I usually don't want it sitting at an angle or some people would say cattywampus on my desk I slide it over to the edge of the desk and a lot of times I'll make sure that the edge of the wood and the edge of the plastic on the laptop are aligned. I make sure that my pen container on my desk is arranged in such a way that there are lead pencils here, there are ink pens here, there are different color ink pens here, and then the highlighters are over here. I would probably drive you all crazy if I lived with you. It's one of my weaknesses. It's a strength, but in a way, it's one of my weaknesses. In fact, I remember being a student at Campbell Divinity School, and one of my professors asked me why exactly I was in the ministry. I thought that was a puzzling question, but we had done the Myers-Briggs personality type indicator test, and I was an off-the-chart J in my personality. It means that I'm judging doesn't mean that I'm a judgmental person it means that I like things in a particular order I like a routine I like consistency and as we were talking about it in a supervised ministry class we were going over those different things and we were talking about how our unique personalities related to our calling our vocation in ministry and it was then and there that Dr. Brock just point blank looked at me and said how can you even function in ministry when you want everything to be so perfect we live in a world that shoots for perfection don't we think about a perfect game in baseball the other week I was watching football and there were some shots from the 1972 Miami Dolphins team the only team to go through the season perfect watch any number of commercials nowadays and you will find advertisement after advertisement for things to make our lives better, to make us prettier, to make us smarter, to make us stronger, to make us healthier. We live in a world that focuses on being the best that we can be, and if there's something wrong with us, then, well, we're made to feel like we're a lesser kind of individual. 
We live in a society that tries to accentuate all of the good things in our lives while ignoring what we call the weaknesses. And it's a struggle not only for our present day world, It's been a struggle for a lot of people for many generations and even for the believers in Corinth. During his second missionary journey, Paul traveled to the region. He spent considerable time there making tents, ministering alongside of two individuals by the name of Aquila and Priscilla. Corinth was a very diverse kind of community. Some people would call it the Las Vegas, the Los Angeles, the New York City of that particular day and time where there's a lot going on there, a lot of things to see, a lot of things to do. There are a lot of different influences, religions, philosophies. It was a true hotbed for mission for someone like the Apostle Paul. But there was one thing that even the believers in Corinth wrestled with. And they struggled with what we would call spiritual pride. And you find over and over again, when you read the fullness of 1 Corinthians, Paul addresses things like inadequacy. He challenges a lot of the modern-day thinking of his day and essentially of our day as well that it's important to be smarter than the next person. That this person's gifts are more important in the kingdom of God than someone else's gifts. That there are greater people and lesser people within the kingdom of God. One of the challenges that he faces head on comes in that wonderful chapter we call the love chapter. After dealing with issues of spiritual giftedness, Paul says, I want to show you a more excellent way. You say that I'm this, you say that you're capable of that, but if you're not loving each other, then it really doesn't count for anything. Their egos were puffed up. As they became a little more knowledgeable in Christ, as they became a little more sanctified in their journey with God, They started to feel certain for themselves. They began to become confident in who they were and what they were becoming. And in a way, they almost made it seem like they were the ones who had been able to achieve all of these things in their lives. But we find that time and time again, Paul challenges that logic and reminds not only the Corinthians 2,000 years ago, but even believers today, that we are not who we are as Christians because of what we know or where we've come from or how much we have or the experiences that we've enjoyed in life. It comes back to the word grace I love that word grace in fact Philip Yancey in his book What's So Amazing About Grace focuses on this very subject and in the introduction to that book he speaks of grace as being the one last really great word in the English language there are a lot of great words out there love hope, encouragement, but what about grace? We live in a world that seems to be ungraceful at times. We live in a world where we want forgiveness, but we're not willing to extend forgiveness. We live in a world where we feel somehow worthy of God's love, but when it comes to loving our neighbor or our enemy we won't know part in that it's the issue of grace that Paul brings up time and again in many of his writings and he brings up that very subject in the opening portion 
of 1 Corinthians. And a lot of times when you read Paul's letters, in the opening few verses, you can get a pretty good idea of where the apostle might be heading. Things that were really heavy upon his heart, things that he was convicted of, things that he was concerned about amongst the believers in the various communities to whom he wrote whether it be the believers in Rome or in the central part of modern-day Turkey known as Galatia or Ephesus or here in Corinth. Paul understood something about the circumstances of those believers. He knew who they were, where they had come from. He knew what they were capable of being for the sake of God's kingdom. But he also knew some of their weaknesses. He knew those points, those places in their lives that weren't really consistent with the life and the teaching of Jesus Christ. And here we find Paul calls several of those different things in to question. He begins the letter by identifying himself as an apostle one who is called of God, not one who came up with this idea of being an evangelist and going out on mission, but one who is who he is and does what he does because of his relationship to God through Jesus Christ. And just as quickly, he emphasizes who the people in Corinth are. You all are also followers of Jesus Christ but you're not the only ones. You are a part of something that's far greater than one group of people or maybe a few congregations in one isolated area of the Roman Empire. You are who you are. You are capable of doing what you do the same way that I'm called of God, and that is by the grace of God. Grace is a tough word. I agree with Philip Yancey. I think it is one of the last really beautiful words in our language because, well, it's so limited. We live in a world that seeks revenge. We live in a world that seeks trying to outdo someone else. We live in a world, as I started out with, that glamorizes our abilities who we are, how much we have, what we're capable of doing versus the fact that each and every day, every moment of each and every day, we are all dependent upon the grace of God. If not for the grace of God, we wouldn't be here. If not for the grace of God, we would have about three chapters within our Bible. And honestly, we wouldn't even have a Bible because history would not have continued. We think of the stories of Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel. And even after the flood, when Noah and his family came out of the ark, it was supposed to be a fresh start, but once again, sin entered into the world. If I had been God, I don't know if you're like me, sometimes you sit back and you think, well, if I was God, I would do this and this and this and this. Honestly, I don't know that I would have started over. I tried. It didn't work out so good. That's the end of it. But because of who God is in his nature through and through, God is love, God is mercy, and God is this word we call grace. Willing to love us and take care of us in spite of ourselves willing to give us the second and third chances when we stumble, when we don't always get things right. When we're not as perfect as we think we should be. When we feel like other people are maybe better than us, closer to God, more spiritual. It's easy for us to get down on ourselves because of what we don't know or how we don't feel about something in our relationship with God. And that's when we come back to these words of the Apostle Paul reminding us that throughout our lives, it's all about grace. 
It's about grace that we exist. It's about grace that we're saved. It's about grace that we are capable of carrying forward the mission of this thing we call the church. One of the first things that we notice in Paul's letter is the fact that it is by grace that we are set apart for God's special usage. Paul uses some fancy terminology. It's a word in theology we call sanctification. If you open up our original Free Will Baptist little white book, Articles of, Articles of Faith, Principles of Church Government for those of the English General Baptist heritage, you're going to find a section on our salvation. What we believe about our salvation and there in the midst of that article is this word sanctification. It's a fancy word, but it's not a complicated word. It means to be set apart. But not just to be set apart for anything, to be set apart for something special. And in this case, to be a part of God's special redeeming work within the world makes me think back to my childhood growing up at my grandparents when the holidays came around there were certain dishes certain things that came out of the china cabinet because it was a special occasion you didn't pull out the styrofoam and the paper you pulled out the good stuff we might say and I always hated that because pulling out the good stuff meant you had to wash all of it by hand. But it was unique. It was different. It was set aside not to be used for a bologna sandwich and chips. It was to be used when the holidays came around, be it Thanksgiving or Christmas or maybe Easter when the family came together. It was important. It was designated for those reasons by my grandmother. Although we're not pieces of Christmas china or fine china in general, you and I have been set aside for a special purpose. And that's to make God known in the world. And the only way that we are set apart is by the grace of God. We're not good enough on our own. We're not smart enough on our own. We're not wealthy enough on our own to deserve this kind of favor from God. But we are set apart because of who God is. And God is the God of grace. The God who sees through us in spite of our mistakes. The God who loves us in spite of our weaknesses. A God who truly cares for us, even though we're not always going to get things right in this journey of life and faith. A second point we could take away from Paul in this letter is the fact that it's by grace that we are equipped in order to carry out our calling. Not only does Paul identify the believers in Corinth as those who have been set aside to do something for God, they've also been set aside and gifted or equipped in such a way as to carry out that ministry. The idea is the fact that God doesn't leave us hanging. God equips us with what we need the abilities, the know-how, the resources to achieve kingdom ministry. It's not about what we can come up with, invent, create by ourselves. God calls us into this thing called a relationship with God through Christ. God sets us apart for His good pleasure and to accomplish His work in the world. And how do we do that? We do that, as Paul says, knowing that we have been strengthened, that we are not lacking in any spiritual gift. And why is that, once again? 
because of that word grace. It's by grace that we've been saved, but it's also by grace that we're accomplishing anything at all for the cause of God's kingdom here on earth. But sometimes we allow our egos to get in the way. Sometimes we allow our personal preferences to get in the way. Sometimes the me, myself and I, creeps in and rears its ugly head. We're called of God, and we carry forth the mission of the church by the giftedness of God. And both of those are capable only because of the nature of God's grace. A third and final point that we can take away is this. It's by grace that we are capable of completing this mission. It's only by grace that we can complete our work, and Paul says specifically, without shame. We're set apart by God, we're gifted by God, but God wants us to persevere. God wants us to press on through the difficult times, even when it's difficult to be a people of faith. God wants us to keep our chin up. God wants us to keep our gaze forever focused upon Him. And why is that? As Paul says toward the end of those verses, so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's Paul's longing that his hearers and his readers will stick through, stick to this journey of faith. That they will use their spiritual giftedness until such a time as God calls us home. And the only way that we can stick to the ministry, the only way that we can persevere in the ministry, the only way that we can keep driving forward, especially in today's society, is by the grace of God. I look back at the history of Christianity I think about some of the things that we've looked at in our study of the book of Acts over the past few months. And it's a wonder that we're even here. When you read of the strife and the schisms and the rifts and so forth that took place amongst early believers, when you go beyond Scripture and look at the first four, five, six hundred years of Christianity, how in the world we have survived and how in the world God took fishermen and a zealot and a tax collector, this motley crew, and turned the world upside down is beyond me. This past week we were looking at a portion of Acts and when the believers are moving from Thessalonica to Berea and on to Athens, we're told that upon Paul and Silas's arrival in Thessalonica, there were certain Jews that became jealous of the ministry being performed by Paul and Silas. And so they created a mob and they stirred up all kinds of dissension there in the city of Thessalonica. And when they presented Paul and Silas before the magistrates, they claimed that these men, these outsiders, are turning the world upside down. It has to be a grace thing. Because how could God take a handful of people who were not the most eloquent speakers, who were not the most intelligent by that day and time, and create a movement that has been transforming the world for some 2,000 years? It's truly a God thing. And the only way that you and I are going to stick with this ministry, the only way that we're going to see it through to completion so that one day when we stand before God, we need not be ashamed of how we lived our lives is as we lean upon God's grace through and through. 
Yesterday I went back to Greene County to officiate a funeral. As I was meeting with the family this past week, they were talking about the man and his faith, things that were important to him in his faith, things that he struggled with in his faith. And one of the key things that came up time and again in our conversation the other day was the word grace. Even though he had attended church, he had been raised in church, even though he had been a believer for much of his 79 years of life, he still wrestled with God's grace, trying to be worthy of it, trying to understand how God could take a human being like him who really wasn't a terrible person but could still love him in spite of his imperfections. It was mind-blowing. His wife, his siblings, they continued to try to reassure him of that in the final days with Parkinson's. Grace is something we're all going to wrestle with. And it should be something we wrestle with because we know we can't earn it. We know we don't deserve it. It's God's free gift. Now, what are we doing with this free gift? How are we receiving it into our lives? And how is it changing us in such a way that now we want to go out and let the world around us know of this same precious gift given by God? By the grace of God. By the grace of God, we're saved. By the grace of God, we awoke from our sleep. By the grace of God, we are together as the people of God. And by the grace of God, we go forth to be his hands and feet. Thanks be unto God. Amen and amen. Our hymn of invitation, our song of commitment today is number 201, Grace Greater Than Our Sin. Maybe you find yourself struggling with God's grace. You wonder how in the world God could save a sinner like you. But God can. And God will. Not because of anything that we're capable of doing, but because we trust that His Son Jesus and his life, death, burial, and resurrection are more than sufficient to cover a multitude of sin in our lives, to pick us up, to dust us off, to set us on firm ground again, to give us another opportunity. It doesn't mean that we're going to be perfect in this life, but it means that God doesn't give up on us even when we try to give up on ourselves sometimes. Maybe you would like to recommit your life to following Christ and being the servant God wants you to be. Perhaps there are needs that are close to your hearts or even praises you would like to come and celebrate with your Heavenly Father. No matter the need, no matter the condition of your heart, this altar is open. And I extend that same opportunity to those who are viewing today via the web stream. Will we respond? as God's Spirit is leading. Will you stand?
house of our Savior and Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you as you leave this place of worship, as you go forth to be his hands and feet in the days to come. Would you bow to receive our benediction and the blessing of today's offering? Lord, there are no words to express how grateful we are for your grace. Lord, it's something we long for in our lives, but Lord, it's also something that we should long for others to experience for themselves. You called us to be instruments of your grace, and we're only able to do that through the using of our spiritual gifts and resources. And even then, those abilities happen in and through your grace. Lord, I ask that you would walk with my brothers and sisters as they go out into the world this week. Help them in both word and action. Let others know there is a God, a God who is loving, a God who is merciful, a God who is gracious and willing to save, forgive, and cleanse. It's a great calling that you've placed in our lives. Now as we depart this place, equip us to go out and fulfill this calling with every breath of our lives. Bless also these tithes and offerings that we will receive. Multiply them to the ongoing ministry of your kingdom here upon earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go in the peace of Christ.